Hello Horror Hounds. I re actually really enjoyed doing the last Horror Memories video. So I wanted to do another one. I don't know how many there are to come. I've got maybe an idea for five bubbling away, but decided that we really need to touch on the most important one. If we're talking about my formative years of horror, my developing taste in horror, there's one, there's one name, there's one big hitter. If I was born in 75, so if you were a horror fan in the UK in the mid uh, to late 80s, so just entering your teens, the picture if I do more and more of these videos that will grow is a situation whereby you would, you'd hear about a lot of stuff word of mouth, I remember hearing wild tales about what was actually <laughs> in Texas Chainsaw Massacre before uh, we were finally allowed to watch it before it got a, a cinema release many, many years later. We're talking about horror fans uh, like me growing up in, uh, in the era of video nasties, so lots of movies getting banned, but also at the same time... <laughs> You'd, you'd be able to sneak watches. Someone would have a video or someone's parents would have a video of something that you could sneak a watch at. Uh, this stuff became like contraband. It became more illicit because of it. But there were other avenues. Um, Fangoria magazine was a big resource, but it, it always wet the appetite. It always showed you pictures and stories about movies that you, that you just... You couldn't see. You were too young, uh, you know, unless you had to harry your parents. That's a story for another video. There was one place to go, though. There was one name. There was one dependable vendor for high-end horror. Serious, bloody, descriptive, no holds barred, thrilling, chilling, Covering a wide range of varieties. Sex as well. Almost always a sex scene. Very important for a, for a pubescent uh, horror fan at the time. And again, adding to that sense of, of the illicit. Because you can, you can go into a bookshop. You can go into a second-hand bookshop. You can go into a library. And you can get yourself a copy of any of James Herbert's books. And this man delivered the goods. I'm not a fan of all of his stuff by any means. But this isn't a critical video. This is a nostalgic video. This is a celebration of the man's work. No longer with us, sadly. Uh, so I'm not going to start dissecting what's good and what's not good. And the man had as many detractors uh, as he did fans. And he had as many imitators. Um... A huge swathe uh, of, uh, of imitators came after him. He released his first novel, The Rats, in 1974. Same year, uh, I believe, Stephen King published his first novel, Carrie. Uh, but I've got to tell you guys, especially you guys watching uh, in the US, because I've got uh, mainly US viewers. Uh, in the UK at that time, James Herbert, man, I know he never really, he never really travelled across the Atlantic. I never get the feeling that his success travelled across the Atlantic. Uh, the other way around the world, forget about it. His books have been translated into, into tons of languages. Uh, he's sold... Where's his... Where's my notes? Excuse me. About uh, 54 million copies sold worldwide. And I don't know when that was published. It's probably gone up since then. This guy was, this guy was the real deal. Uh, and his first novel, The Rats, uh, inspired, surely inspired by uh, his upbringing in the East End of London. His parents ran a fruit and stall, uh, fruit and vegetable stall in a, in the market, and he used to see uh, the rats, the London rats, there uh, eating their wares uh, and the leftovers and stuff like that. And so. Uh, his first novel is just one that absolutely goes for the throat. Uh, giant mutant 
killer rats that start off uh, munching on, on on the poor of the east end of London, and nothing's really done about it until they start spreading out and uh, eating the important people, the you know the more well-to-do people. There's social commentary in here, but there's just the most gut-wrenching, bloody, gory horror. Uh, just think, think of Sam Raimi's early uh, early films, but without any of the the slapstick and without any of the the comedy and the Three Stooges and cartoonish elements that he loved so much. And so, for a young horror enthusiast who could only hear about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, sort of. Uh, knew 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 about Freddy and was you know had to had to wait a few years to get uh, to be able to start regularly seeing uh, these movies. So you had to see what was on telly. Uh, so uh, the Hammer stuff it, it led to an excellent schooling in horror. Don't get me wrong, because you started off watching the older stuff and moving towards more modern stuff. But you know you wanted more. You wanted more, 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 more. And within the pages of a book that doesn't have uh, a, an age certification on the back of it, you could get it. The, the Rats story eventually turned into, into a trilogy, Lair and Domain, which takes it to an absolute other level. Uh, in, in Lair, some of the rats moved to Epping Forest and a few years later uh, explode out again. Domain kicks it up. Uh, kicks it into just uh, another gear altogether. It starts, the book starts with a nuclear attack on London uh, and follows uh, a group of survivors who have hidden in uh, a government nuclear fallout bunker uh, under, I believe, under the Houses of Parliament, under some official government building. Uh, and in much the same way as John Wyndham's uh, Dare the Triffids, the, 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 the blindness causes uh, humans to fall down a few notches on uh, on the food chain. So the triffids are the apex predators. The rats, uh, the reason it's called domain is because the rats now make the bond at London uh, their domain. They, they rule it, they own it. After they infiltrate the shelter, a small group of survivors have to travel through post-nuclear London uh, and survive the, the bands of survivors. And the rats who rule the city by this point. Years and years later, uh, he wrote uh, a graphic novel called The City, which which is sort of set an undisclosed time after the nuclear war and follows uh, follows a man uh, returning to well now the city, what was uh, London, uh, to try, if I recall, and. Uh, Find his house, his old house. Um, that's quite rare, I think. Uh, I'm glad I got that. But what else have we got? Um, if we're personally reminiscing, there are two things I have to touch on. When I was uh, when I was 13, uh, my dad took me and my brother to London to a comic shop called Forbidden Planet, where James Herbert was signing his latest book at the time, Haunted. This is one of my favourites. Uh, he, he, he goes from bloody, you know, really bloody, grab you by the throat, screaming, shrieking horror, to this is a, a classic ghost story in the English mould. Uh, the genius of this is, it's like a Victorian ghost story, but it's set in modern day. And uh, the protagonist, a character called David Ash, will return in two subsequent books, is a paranormal investigator, so you get a lot of insight into that job uh, and the ins and outs of it. He's actually a paranormal investigator who, through a childhood experience, kind of, well, he knows that the supernatural exists, that ghosts exist, but he actually does this job to try and debunk any haunting he's sent to investigate, to try and disprove the horror from his childhood. I got, uh, I was... Lucky enough then uh, to get this signed by the man, and he was uh, he was gracious enough to pose for a picture for me at the time. And if you want to see, I'll just I'll use my fingers as pixels because uh, I'm 
I'm sure my brother doesn't want his uh, 11 year old photo broadcast over the internet. Uh, but there's 13 year old me <laughs> posing with a, uh, a fairy dummy uh, for the day. So this instantly became, uh, for 13 year old me, this is my most prized possession. I didn't realize you could actually, uh, these, these people <laughs> whose names were on these, I didn't realize you could meet them. Uh, I didn't realize that could happen and suddenly he was there and, and I was a bit tongue tied. Uh, many years later, fast forward to 1999 uh, and my dream was to become a writer and it's, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't working. I was having a long, I was having a, a, a dark night of the soul about it and unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend at the time wrote, wrote to him via his publishers uh, to ask if he could maybe send some word of encouragement. I didn't know any of this was happening, but uh, October 1999, I received uh, a letter from the man, a letter of encouragement, uh, signed signed photo. You know what I love about this? Uh, I can tell that he didn't get a secretary or PA to write it. There are a couple of uh, typing errors on this. So I, I know he did this on his, on his own word processor. He was rushing to correspond. I'm sure he took, took a few hours each morning to reply to correspondence. Uh, but this, I can't even really put into words uh, what, uh, what getting a letter of encouragement from uh, your favorite horror author, uh, favorite contemporary horror author means. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that there and I don't really need to underline it with a commentary. You can tell that's that's so special to me. I'm not really here to sell James Herbert on guys who haven't heard of him, but uh, because well, some of his novels now might seem like a bit of a time capsule from the '70s, from the '80s, uh, but there is. There is no getting away from the fact that uh, this 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 guy's I'm str I'm struggling to really put into words how how fundamental the work of James Herbert was to me as as a young boy growing up uh, to be told that there are things that you can't see. Uh, movies that you can't have or, or, or go and watch or that just get flat outright banned so that they enter this this mythical world the exorcist the texas chainsaw massacre you know or the friday the 13th movies um all of these things that you crave that are denied to you um to have uh, someone writing at the, at the time who you could sneak books in under the radar is what I'm trying to say. And reading's good for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's good. It's good to read books. So your parents are pleased that you're reading. <laughs> you're pleased that you're reading because in between these pages, you get you get what you need. You get what as a kid. You know you can handle, but everyone else says, oh, you'll get nightmares. You know, you can't watch this movie. You'll get nightmares. Uh, well, <laughs> no, you're too young. Sod you. I'm not too young. I've read The Dark, for fuck's sake. <laughs> this is an appropriately titled book. This is, this is dark. His second book, uh, The Fog, and this sounds quite ludicrous for a premise, Trust me, the, the book takes takes the mickey out of itself for its premise. Uh, there's social commentary in here as well. It's the the fog is ostensibly it's about a killer fog. Um, way before John Carpenter's movie, by the way, uh, the fog. Um, government experiments, uh, Ministry of Defense experiments, uh, and an accident causes uh, the release of uh, a a bacteria, uh, a viral weapon that was that was thought 
contained safely. Uh, as it uh, as it expands and multiplies, its byproduct becomes this sort of mist, this fog. Uh, its effect on uh, humans is to turn them completely insane. Uh, so obviously, the denouement of this book is the fog settles across London, and the the entire uh, the entire city of London goes insane way before the rage virus and 28 days later. I'll tell you one thing that James Herbert could write. He could write a set piece. He could write a big disaster piece. Uh, there's one of his books uh, that ends with, with a huge mansion going up in flames. And um, it's, uh, there's, uh, uh, in this, in a couple, uh, this begins with a jetliner falling out of the sky a few years, I think, before the Lockerbie Air disaster. Um, uh, the Jonah has a, has a flood at the end. 48, my friends. 48 is an alternate history novel set in 1948. Uh, uh, and in this alternate history, as a, a last defiant act of World War II, Hitler releases um, uh, what's called the Blood Death. On London, V2 rockets loaded with a viral agent that uh, that kills most, uh, and there's a survivor living in the ruins of uh, London. So it it starts with the decimation of London, like Domain does, uh, and follows uh, an, an American pilot who was stationed in London who survived. He was immune to the blood death. Uh, three years uh, later, a little like. Um, I am legend, Matheson's I am legend, uh, surviving in the, in the streets of London uh, and uh, being followed by uh, by British Nazis who want to try and use his blood as a cure for their leader's slow death from, from the blood death. Um, There's just some great stuff in there. Uh, and like, I, as I started off saying, if, if you were a, a kid who loved horror in the mid to late 80s, um, with all due respect to Stephen King, if you're in the UK, there was one name. Horror had one name, and it was James Herbert. And wherever you are, sir, thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my black, <laughs> twisted, horror-loving soul.